Embarking on the Black Whale, the Succession War is Hunter Hunter's most ambitious arc yet, not only due to the sheer amount of characters it's trying to juggle, but because it's the accumulation and extension of Hunter Hunter's themes and morality set up by previous arcs. I mean it when I say that the Succession War has the potential to even rival the brilliance of the Chimera Ant arc and to be Togashi's magnum opus. However, in order to understand where the Succession War is headed, it's important to take a deeper look at the movies and mythology that inspired this arc, as well as dive into the mind of the man, the myth, the legend, Togashi himself. So let's break a few things down. First, it's important to note that Togashi likes switching things up to keep things exciting for himself, and maybe for the readers too. Each major arc of Hunter x Hunter embodies a different genre. For example, Greed Island is based off of RPGs, the York New arc is a crime noir thriller, while the Chimera Ant arc is... Uh, war and depression. Think of the Chimera Ant arc as Togashi's blue period. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. So if I were to classify the latest arc, I'd describe it as a survival horror story with a political thriller undercurrent, acting as a homage to Togashi's favorite movies including Alien, 28 Days Later, and John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. In fact, if we take a look at Hunter x Hunter, we can find countless movie easter eggs as well as plot parallels. First, the movie Alien. In Togashi's Phantom Rogue interview, Togashi discusses how it's his favorite movie, elaborating that he enjoys it because people are put in a situation of limited space and die off one by one. <laughs> we can see the same premise reflected within this current arc. On a more superficial level, Benjamin's Nun Beast looks like a xenomorph. Then we've got the Black Whale, not a spaceship, but a ship nonetheless, where the passengers are for the most part trapped. The princes are bound by the urn ceremony ritual, the lifeboats are guarded, and teleportion abilities like Nods and Luini's are hard to come by. Then, add on top of that, both Alien and Hunter Hunter's current plots are driven by a greedy contracting organization. With Alien, the Wayland yutani Corporation sends spaceships to procure xenomorphs to use as bioweapons, even at the cost of the crew's life. Likewise, V6 is sending the Hunters Association to explore the Dark Continent, even though it is the birthplace of the Chimera Ants, Nanika, and home to far deadlier creatures. I mean, if Alien's plot serves as any warning, Going to the Dark Continent is a really bad idea. Unless you're a freaks trying to commune and be one with nature, human greed is really going to bite characters in the butt. Enough about Alien though. Next, in the same Phantom Rogue interview, Togashi doesn't give us a specific movie as his second favorite, but instead he lists the zombie genre as a whole. And likewise, we can see Togashi playing around with the concept of contagion and outbreak in this arc. For instance, there's a slight nod to Biohazard the zombie game with one ability's name. However, on a more substantial level, we also have Morena's ability, which is described as a bacterial contamination that can spread. Already, Morena's followers have started slaughtering other passengers, planting the seeds of paranoia and panic aboard the ship. And fear itself can be the most powerful contagion of all. Just ask the Joker. Introduce a little anarchy. Upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. Misai also recognizes this. This is why he warns his security team about the likelihood of civil unrest, considering that there's not nearly enough guards compared to the number of passengers aboard. This is a disaster waiting to happen, a ticking time bomb, and it's only a matter of time before order breaks down. You know, we see the question of balance posed a lot throughout this arc, as well as the cost of keeping it. 
We see the disparity of wealth and power between social classes. We can see a stark contrast between the nobility's quarters filled with paintings and various displays of opulence and the cockroach-infested quarters in the lower tiers where people sleep on the floor. Moreover, the Kokken Empire is literally described as a caste system where people's social status is determined at birth. You have afterlife companions as well as royal bastards known as the Underrakers who are scarred at birth and forbidden from becoming heirs. So who stands to upset the delicate equilibrium aboard the ship? Who are the chaotic wild cards here? My first bet is on Morena, who's introduced in a chapter aptly named Balance, where she's not so subtly shown walking a tightrope while delivering a monologue about tearing down the world as revenge for being discarded by it. I think it's also no coincidence that in this same chapter, we're also shown another group of misfits, the spiders. The majority of them come from Meteor City, a dumping ground whose citizens don't officially exist on public record. And aside from the elders of Meteor City, they show little regard for authority. Also, keep in mind that Crollo is incredibly unstable right now and still reeling from the deaths of Cortopi and Shalnar. So if any more troop members die, which is extremely likely to happen due to Neon's prophecies, we're going to get an indoor fish in Requiem Part 2. <laughs> it's going to be epic. Next, of course, if I'm going to talk about the Succession War arc, I also need to talk about the Succession War itself and its sinister origins. We know that the urn ceremony is inspired by the Chinese black magic ritual of the creation of goo, or otherwise known as worm toxin. In this ritual, five poisonous creatures like a snake, centipede, scorpion, or spider are all sealed together in a jar so that they can fight to the death and devour each other one by one. The surviving creature was therefore believed to have absorbed all the toxins of the others, transforming into a goo spirit. Likewise, if this is a metaphor for the succession war, I have a feeling that the winner may gain some supernatural ability. This is hinted at by skeptical Mizai and from the ominous and creepy burial chambers we catch a glimpse of after Prince Mimose's death. To me, they remind me of the burial chamber room in Alien vs. Predator, so I can't help but wonder what if there really is a supernatural element behind the Kokken Empire's success and it comes at the cost of a massive blood sacrifice. You know, kind of like how an entire nation was turned into a transmutation circle in Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> Beneath this arc story, I feel like there's an underlying criticism of leaders willing to sacrifice others for self-gain, to pull the hypothetical lever instead of getting creative with their trolley problem. In part, I get this impression based on an infamous and disturbing painting shown during King Nasubi's monologue, and of course, the painting I'm referring to is Goya Saturn Devouring His Son. Painted during Spain's bloody civil war, this painting graphically depicts Saturn, the king of the gods, eating one of his own sons in order to prevent a prophecy of being dethroned by one of his children. However, as the story goes, his son Jupiter manages to survive and eventually dethrones him anyway. Likewise, I think this painting foreshadows the Kokken Empire's inevitable reformation or collapse. And last but not least, I want to address the occult undercurrent and religious symbolism going on in this art. And not just because Crowlo Lucifer is sad sane or that Morena looks like a evil Jesus in a crown of thorns. No, the character I'm referring to is Sirtni, and I know I've called him the Antichrist multiple times in past videos, but I'm not kidding. He literally embodies the Antichrist because his main nen ability conjures 666, the mark of the beast. We don't know exactly what this ability does yet, but if there's any inspiration from John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, I have a feeling that Tsirkmi is a satanic figure who will convert his followers into inhuman minions.
Who then in this scenario is Jesus, you might ask? Well, I'm going to go with the most prominent mother and child in the bunch, so I'm going to say Queen Oito and Prince Wobel are Madonna and child. But oh boy, I hope that doesn't mean Wobel's gonna die for our sins. I'm simultaneously excited for and dreading to see where this story is going to go. In essence, the succession war is set up to be one huge social experiment. The hunter's exams on steroids. Think of this current arc like the battle royale or hunger games of the Hunter Hunter series where characters are stuck aboard a ship in a battle to the death and we're going to see a whole new meaning to the term cabin fever. With 200,000 lives at stake, we are going to see a lot of moral dilemmas in this arc. Characters push to their extremes, and as a result, we are going to see the best and worst of humanity.